Good, good. Johnny looks good. <laughs> um, we are six days of Christmas, um, and uh, just wanted to say a little something about that. Um, you know, we go through the year um, and just, you know, kind of do our thing, go to work, raise kids, do all that kind of stuff. And we get to this season, which I think for most people, it's probably their favorite time of year, just lights, Christmas trees, whatever, family. But we really need to sit down and slow down and just what is really important. You know, family, yes. Friends, yes. But the reason, as we heard, that the reason for the season is Christ. And we celebrate the birth of Christ, and that needs to always be priority. That's why I want to sing Christmas songs all year, but Sheldon won't let me. No, but seriously, we need to think that all year, not just this time of year. So that's just one thing that was on my heart this morning that I wanted to share with you. So um, i still a little nasally, so I apologize, cough. That may come up during the songs. But um, anyway, we'll get through them. Like I said, God, God knows we have great intentions. So if you will, please stand with me if you can to worship, and we'll begin our service. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strain. up and 
and star shining in the east beyond them far and to the earth it gave great light and so it continued both day and nights no far to seek for a king was their intent and to follow the star wherever it went no taking our tithes and offerings during this song. Please continue to worship. <clears throat> oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth <clears throat> A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn Fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices, oh, night divine, oh, night when Christ was born, oh, us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chain shall he break for the slave is our brother. And in his name all oppression shall see. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His
fourth Sunday, as we light the fourth Advent candle, let it remind us that this is the time to see and share the love of God. Luke 1, 26 through 38. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will call, be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, to be born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own old age. And she who was, with, who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. We all have favorite Christmas carols. Some are dissonant, lamenting the years of pain, waiting for the Messiah. Others are joyous, even rushes, celebrating and proclaiming the birth of Jesus. Still others are soft and quiet and speak deeply to the emotion of our hearts. Silent Night, Holy Night, is one of those soft, quiet carols. This hymn is, unlike oth some others, less of a theological treatise and more of a reminder that the coming of Christ is God's most profound expression of his deep love for his children. This carol draws us to Christ who comes as the brightest expression of God's unending, unwavering love. This is a picture of Christ in whom the fullness of God's nature, God's essence, is revealed. This song reminds us that when Jesus is born, God's unparalleled, redeeming, transforming grace dawns on us and on the whole world. And in, his, in, in response to his love, to hear his call to the rest in the loving arms of our Father. On this fourth Sunday in Advent, let us give thanks for the tender mercy of God incarnate in the Christ child. And as we give thanks, let us open our hearts to the love of God for all people. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, may your love in Christ Jesus flood our proud and busy hearts that we, your children, might rest in your arms and trust in your tender care. Amen. Good morning, family. What a beautiful morning it is. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of agreement on that one. What's up with that? Man, 11, you guys like war or something, don't you? It, uh, well, warm, warm weather helps a little, I suppose, you know, with the whole cheery thing. But, man, it's fresh when you walk outside. Wasn't it fresh in them lungs, right? Freshen them right up. You know, you had that little bit of a runny nose. You walked outside. It wasn't running anymore. You know, it was a fresh, it's a great morning. It's a beautiful morning. God helps us in so many ways. Uh, what a beautiful day we have before us. And, and uh, online, start dropping in your prayers and praises, if you would, please. Um, just uh, a couple of short announcements. One being this afternoon um, at 3 o'clock is the the um, Canton Area Toys for Tots. They're wrapping the presents and stuff over to CUMC. Um, they said, I, was, I happened to talk to Laurel yesterday, and, and she said that um, they still, if anyone else still wants to step up uh, more than what already planned on it, that there's certainly plenty of room to wrap more presents. Um, and so they're going to be doing that over there today. Um, the, uh, and then the other thing is just the Christmas Eve service, um, our Christmas Eve service, 5 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Um, and so that's all I have for announcements today. Um, do we have any prayer requests?
So we have a little bit of a praise report too. Um, Leighton got tubes this this Wednesday, and that went well, um, and he's doing a lot better now. So thank you for that. Um, but another thing that uh, we have friends um, who are missionaries to Romania, and their apartment caught on fire. Um, like they had to jump balcony to balcony. They were on the sixth floor, um, and they they got out all right. Um, and God's been um, has provided for them. And you know, they woke up at one to their apartment on fire, jumping balcony to balcony, and then that morning they were doing a children's service again. So um, God's still still moving. But uh, just that's a lot of, they lost a lot of stuff and they're not even in their home country anymore to be able to help and, and give them. So just for some comfort and, and a new apartment. And yeah, they don't have anywhere to live and okay. stuff like that. So in the back. Joe Clay, um, would like prayers. She's having a health issues the past three weeks, and she's going to have a procedure tomorrow. And she would appreciate the prayers. All right. Well, let's let's go to our Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so very very much. Thank you for today. Thank you for this this moment in time, Lord. Thank you right for right here right now. Father God, we just, um, there's so much that happens in life. And, and in this season right now where, where we've commercialized so much that shouldn't have been commercialized, where we, we, we put far more value on the dollar and, and, the, and on the, the um, craziness that got to go, got to go, got to go. Lord, I just ask that you help each and every one of us as we walk into this week, that we would walk into this week, dear Lord, not go running not go 90 mile an hour on the curve, but instead we'd walk into this week, Lord, and we would we'd walk into your arms. And Lord, we would remember the reason for the season that's coming up, that, that as we walk into this week and we start all the family celebrations, Lord, that the, the number one celebration would be the birth of your son. And, and what that meant, the birth of your son, and, and in hand with that, the, the Easter day, uh, the, the resurrection. And Lord, this is the beginning of that journey. And so, Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to be solemn and, and sovereign and reverent, Lord, in in our holiday season, Lord, and and just ask that um, uh, we would we would get beyond the commercialism of it, dear Lord. What man has done to um, the beauty of the birth of your Son, dear Lord, the gift that it was that it is, um, Lord. Also, ask that you would uh, we say, well, actually, we say thank you for. Um, the procedure for Leighton, that, um, man, the relief of that pressure, that infection out of his ears and stuff, and, and Lord, just that, uh, that he can get rest, he can have comfort. Um, we thank you for that. We thank you that Jared and, and Kaylee are able to get some rest as well now, and Lord, just ask that you um, refresh them as well. Lord, we ask that uh, you have your hand on uh, their friends in Romania that are, that are doing your work over there, dear Lord. Um, we thank you so very much that they were safe, that they were woke up. Um, they, they, not everyone wakes up during a fire. And, and so, Lord, thankful that, that you woke them up and, and uh, thankful that as they went from balcony to balcony to escape the fire, Lord, that you protected them and you kept them safe. And, and, um, and, and Lord, you just uh, you had your hand all over them. And, Lord, we thank you for the fact that uh, they were able to right away that doing children's ministry right away again, dear Lord, and, and just continuing on. Satan tries to stop things, and uh, you say, no, nah, that's not going to happen. These are my people. And uh, just like when Satan tried to tried to tempt Job and when he tried to tempt your son, and you said, no, nah, these are my people. Go ahead, you tempt them. Um, doesn't matter. They're still going to go forward with what I have. And, and so, Lord, we thank you for keeping that same hand on these missionaries. And, Lord, we just ask that you would help them replenish them, dear Lord, um, in, in what they need to continue to, to live and continue to do the, the work that you have before them, dear Lord, and that more Romanians will come to know you, dear Lord. More Romanians will come to have a relationship with you, dear Lord. More Romanians will come to eternity and have it with you through the work that they continue to do. 
Lord, we ask that uh, as we have been, we continue to ask that your hand is on Joe. Um, ask that you would help her um, uh, as they go forward with this procedure tomorrow. Uh, ask that uh, you'd have your hand on them, that, that uh, on the care team, that they would um, uh, listen to your voice, dear Lord that they would hear exactly what it is you're saying, exactly what you're leading them to, what you desire for them to do. And, and Lord, just uh, so grateful for um, your hand on her already. Lord, we ask for your hand on her body, heal her body, um, Lord, and, and give her some respite, dear Lord, if you would. And, and we just ask for that, that recovery and that protection, dear Lord. And, uh, Lord, we ask that right now as we prepare to receive this message, as we talk about the one thing, dear Lord, as we talk about that uh, one thing according to you, dear Lord, that we would, we would open our hearts, that we would hear your voice, that we would feel your presence, dear Lord. Um, sometimes we, 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 we don't even feel your presence when we're hearing some things that you've shared with us. And, Lord, I ask that today we would, each and every heart, each and every heart would be opened wide up and would receive your message, dear Lord. Lord, I ask you to keep me out of the way. I ask you to, that you would just bless this message to each and every person who receives it. I ask that uh, um, you would, you would, your, your anointing on this message, dear Lord, would go forth and would prosper. And Father, I just uh, um, ask that uh, all these things and that we ask these things in your loving Son, Jesus' name. And Lord, we also come to you with the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So this morning we're going to talk about one thing. Okay, we're going to talk about several things, but one thing in particular, right? So um, we're going to, uh, we, we've just, we're starting something new, right? In 13 days we start the new year, right? Everyone, we, all, we always have this new year thing, right? Um, we have, uh, we've, we're starting, uh, not this week, but We'll be starting a new series next week, um, um, and and we just came through. Th we came through three series recently here that we just wrapped up with, um, that have been um, everything to do with making sure that we focus on who we we find out we realize who it is that God's calling us to be, what He's calling us to do. Very intentional on that. Um, you know, we we started out with the rethink series. Earlier in the summer, right, we started out with that, rethinking who God is, rethinking who, who God wants us to be, what he's called us to do, right? Uh, we got pretty deep into that. That brought about some very good conversations and, and some changes of heart, right? And then we had the fear series where we talked about, we spent four weeks speaking about the fears, the fears that we have and how do we get past those fears and who leads us through those fears and what are we supposed to do with that fear and should we even have that fear to start with, Right. And then we also, we, um, we just wrapped up our Greatness of God series, which we talked about the greatness or the goodness of God um, and, and w Him in our life. And, and so we've had all of these things, and we're going we're gonna to continue with a new series, and we're going to continue into this new year. And first thing we're going to do, though, is this week we're going to celebrate the new child, the Christ child that was born, right? And what, why did He come, Right? I mean, he came because, because of his love for us, his, his desire that none of us would be lost, because of God's desire for none of us to be lost. That's why Christ came, and, and we're going to be intentional about that. We want to be, always should be intentional, as Todd shared with you and I shared before. Also, um, every day should be Christmas Day for us, right? It shouldn't take one day a year. But unfortunately, because we're human and we tend to get in these cycles, and we've got to have, we gotta have our rhythm, and we've got to have our routine, and we've got to have our system, and, and so we have this thing where, well, one day, one week, a year, we celebrate the birth of Christ, and my goodness, we've got that messed up. But today, I want to, I want to encourage you to start today a new thinking. I want to encourage you new thinking that each and every day, each and every day, Jesus Christ was born. Each and every, I had a conversation with someone this week who said, you know, they, they struggle with the fact because, well, just, we celebrate on De December 25th, but is that really the day, Right? 
I can tell you it's not. We've walked through that a few years ago. We went through a series where, uh, I think it was four, maybe five years ago, we went through a series where uh, I laid out for you. We know for a fact it was not in the wintertime. We know for an absolute fact it was not in the wintertime. And I laid out a whole bunch of things for you, and I'm not going to go through all of them today. But the reality is, no, it was not December 25th when Jesus Christ was born, but we should be celebrating it every day, 365 days a year. It should not matter what day it is, we should be celebrating it every day, right? And so today I want to encourage you to start that new mindset, that new thought process. And today we're going to look at one thing. I want you to be able to focus on one thing, just one thing I'm asking of you. I'm going to have four questions I'm going to ask you, and all four of those things will help you find out what's the one thing God's asking you to do. What's the one thing he's asking you to change? What's the one thing he's asking you to gain? What's the one thing he's asking you to walk away from? What's the one thing? We're going to start today. We're going to start in in Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. God says, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. He's making a way through the wilderness. And he's, he's making streams in the wasteland. He's made, man, that, that could be our hearts. Right? God's saying, I'm doing a new thing. He wants us to be focused on it. He's telling us to forget the past, forget the old. Let's, work, let's focus on the new thing, the new thing I am doing in and through you for my people. And it was, it was, it was true then and it's true today. He's saying, don't remain wrapped up in those past hurts and all that struggle that you had before. Don't remain in that. Come to the new thing. Here, let's take the new step and become who I'm calling you to be in this new day. That's what he wants of us. And I know some of us were saying, I just, I don't see any way out of this. Oh, man, I'm struggling. And this is just, but this, this mess, this thing, this, th- whatever I got going on here, this is just, I just don't see a way out. And God's like, man, I've already made the way. I've already, don't you see it? Don't you, really, don't you see it? Because I can see it plain as day. And I'm laying the steps out for you. All I got to do, you just got to take one step each day. That's what he's saying. Man, we don't even have to, we don't have to see the whole path all the way through the valley, do we? All we need to see is that one step. Just take that one step. And that's what he's saying. He said, I got a new thing going on here. Let's, let's change our focus. Let's a one, new thing. I see it, don't you? That's what he's wanting to know. How many people, by a show of hands, how many people plan to make New Year's resolutions this year? Right? Okay, so here's, here's let, me, let me burst your bubble with your New Year's resolution. Okay? I enjoy doing this. Because, see, here's my theory, here's my theory and I don't mean this bad in any way, and anyone who raised their hand just now is going to go, why did I raise my hand? Right? But, you know, I... I I think New Year's resolutions are stupid. I'm just being honest with you. Here's why. If it's so important that on January 1st I should start it, but I thought of it back in November, why did I not start it in November? If it was so important, why didn't we just start it? Why do we need January 1st to roll around? Here's the thing. Guess what? By the January 31st, 40 per, this is a new study. Just uh, It's only from two years ago. January 31st, 40% of all New Year's resolutions will have been blown out of the water. They're already gone. Toast. Two weeks later, by February 14th, Valentine's Day, oh, sweetheart, I love you. I'm changing for you. By Valentine's Day, when you're telling your sweetheart how you were going to change on January 1st, and by Valentine's Day, 80% of them are gone. 80% of New Year's resolutions are toast by, by February 14th. There's only 9% of New Year's resolutions that actually make it for a year. Only 9%. That's not even a tithe. Why would I want to wait until January 1st to make the new change? Right? And and please don't don't hear me wrong. I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying, for me, I don't want to waste the time. If I'm going to change, let's just change. Let's just get it done. Man, if I wait till January 1st, that gives me a whole lot of days to come up with excuses that I shouldn't make that resolution. Right? I mean, why wait? So anyway, so, so 
just to help you out with that whole thing, right? And here's the thing. I don't know. They don't say why. They don't, they don't ask that question when they ask if you kept your resolution or not. They don't ask why didn't you keep it, right? But I got to believe this. See, New Year's resolutions are full of good intentions. They're full of good intentions. I intend to lose weight. <laughs> if I needed to lose weight and I thought of it in November, I should have started losing it in November. But there was Thanksgiving and then there was Christmas and all that, so I didn't want to do it then, so I went to the New Year. You know, I'm going to start working out. Well, if I knew I was going to start working out in November or October or September, maybe when I went on that deer hunt, right, and I found out how bad a shape I was in, maybe I should have started then instead of January 1st, right? Just make that resolution right now. Make it a personal resolution. It doesn't have to have that day, right? And so I don't know. They don't tell us why, but I, I believe it's because New Year's resolutions are full of good intentions, but they have almost zero God intentions involved. And there's a huge difference between a good intention and a God intention. See, good intentions are me-centered. Me-centered. God intentions are God-centered. That's huge. There's a huge difference between the two. And when we get God-centered, when we have God intentions, which we're going to talk about today, when we have those things, when, when, when God is at the center of the things that we're doing, it makes all the difference in the world. So like I say, I'm going to ask you four, um, four one-thing questions. And I want you to, when, as we go through this, God's going to re reveal some things to you. And I absolutely trust that he will, and I've prayed that he will. He's going to reveal to you at least, at least, one thing. There's going to be something that's extra powerfully re uh, revealed to you today. And whatever that is, I want you to write it down. I want you to write it down. And I don't want you just to write it down. I want you to write it down. I want you to own it. That means we don't leave the CFL laying on the seat when we walk out the door. It means when we write it down, we, we don't throw it in the garbage can on the way out the door. It means when we get home, it doesn't go in the recycle bin. There's that one thing that you're going to write down that I want you to write it down. I want you to own that. I want you to hold on to that. I want you to focus on you. There's one thing. There's something that God's asking you to change. And I don't want you to forget it. So even if you get home and you want to put it, maybe you do the thing where you have the sticky note on the mirror, right, in the bathroom. So every day you wake up with that. This is what God's calling me to do. This is what he's called me to do, right? That's fine. Okay, so then, then, then recycle the CFL. Okay, that's fine. Maybe, maybe it's a deal where you put it on the steering wheel of your car. I've had people tell me about that. It's a sticky note on the steering wheel of their car. I don't know how they get to stay there for very long, but, but you know, that's what they do, right? Or on their, the, the gauge cluster or whatever. Um, and so own it. Own it. It's not a temporary thing. And the first one is this. What one thing do you desire from God? What one thing do you desire from God? When you pray, what is that one thing that you're going to be praying for? What's that one thing that you desire from God? See, there's, it's, it's not wrong for us to desire things. But uh, um, we better make sure they're God-centered, right? We, we, we should, if we're coming to God and asking him for it, we should make sure, well, this is in alignment with what God wants, right? Well, what's that one thing, that one thing that if God, if God were standing here talking to you right now and he said, what's one thing that you desire from me? What is that one thing? What's that one thing you desire? David had, had many things uh, in his life that he desired. Um, uh, he asked God for many different things throughout his life, right? Um, and and he, he was known as God said. He's a man after his own heart, right? After God's own heart. So it's okay to ask for more than that, right? And so please don't, and I want to make sure I clarify this, please don't think I'm saying there's only one thing. There's one thing that's going to be far more powerful, far more revealed to you than the rest of the things. There's going to be other things, and it's okay to ask for other things. There's nothing wrong with other things, but catch this. Psalm 27, verse 4, David said this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. If I could ask for just one thing, David's saying, he's saying what he's saying here is I, I want to be with God. I want to feel God. I want to feel his presence with me. I want to, I want to feel his goodness. I want to see his goodness all around me. I want, to, I, know, I want to know God. 
the one thing, even though he asked for many things, there was one thing that was the primary focus, and that was time with God, all of his time with God, every day of his life with God, all the days of my life. The one thing he wanted was time with God. He wanted to seek God. Now for you, my prayer is that your, your, your number one one is to seek God, right? That time with God, that relationship with God, grow that relationship. Now, some of those other one things, though, that might be affecting you, might be something you need right now, something you desire right now from God, might be maybe it's an addiction. Maybe someone you know has an addiction. Maybe you have an addiction. Maybe you've hidden your addiction. You're, you're pretending you don't have that addiction. But maybe God reveals that to you right now that, guess what? Yes, you do. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe, maybe it's a, um, uh, maybe someone you know isn't a believer. And, and maybe, you know, um, maybe they're suddenly they're sick or whatever. And so now it's come to your forefront, to, your, to the front of your mind that, man, they're not a believer. Maybe that's your one thing, Lord. How do I help them become a believer? What can I do? Whatever. You know what I mean? Maybe it's prayer for someone to become a believer. Maybe it's, some, maybe it's for your marriage. Maybe your marriage isn't doing so good. Maybe you've got some struggles going on, right? Maybe it's for your marriage. And I want to caution you on this because we have a tendency to say, Lord, my wife's screwed up. Could you help her get straight? <laughs> you know? And then God says, guess what, Sheldon? You're the one who screwed up. Right? So when you're praying for your marriage, which you should be praying for your marriage each and every day, be careful. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be careful when you pray because the one who might need to change might be you. Okay? So maybe that's, maybe that's your one desire. Maybe, that, maybe that's that one thing that you desire from God. I don't know. Maybe it's just contentment. Maybe it's, Lord, could you help me be content? Things aren't going great. The waters are really rocking and rolling out here. We've got some storms going on. But could you help me be content just to be in your presence, Lord? I just want to be content. I want to be able to lay my head against your chest and hear your heartbeat day in and day out. I want to lay in your arms, Lord. And be content laying in your arms. Not restless, not anxious, not fearful. Maybe that's your one thing that you desire. The second one, what one thing do you lack? What one thing do you lack? Maybe this is in your spiritual life. Maybe it's in your walk with the Lord, right? What, what one thing do you lack? Mark 10 has an a interesting story of it. it's about this rich guy, right? And he comes to Jesus and said, man, you know what? Guess what? I... I how do I get eternal life? And Jesus says, well, here's the thing. You don't kill anybody. Don't steal. Don't, and he runs through, you're right, and all the commandments. Don't break the commandments. And, and the young rich man's like, got it, man. I got that. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, man. I, I'm good. I'm good. He's feeling pretty good about himself. And then Jesus looks into his heart. And he shows the man something that the man never even knew was there. And he said, go and sell all your stuff and give it away and then come and follow me then come and follow me mark 10 21 jesus looked at him and loved him one thing you lack one thing you lack he said go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven then come follow me one thing I don't believe the young man, I know the young man did not have that in it. He did not realize that was a thing, that that was a problem, that was a struggle. He's like, man, I'm doing, I don't steal, I don't covet, I don't cheat, I don't, boom, 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 all the law. I follow all the law. And yet when Jesus asked him to get rid of the stuff, we know how that ends, right? Because he walks away all dejected, right? Because he loved his stuff. He had his stuff. He wanted his stuff. And he was willing to trade his stuff for eternity with the Lord. That one thing, all he had to do, all he had to do, sounds so easy, doesn't it? All you got to do, just sell all your stuff. That's all you got to do. Give the money away. That's all you got to do. Help the poor. Help the needy. Help those who are struggling. Help those who have a house fire. Help those who had a heart attack. Help those who are in the hospital. Help those. All you got to do and he's like, wow, but yeah, but I don't want to sell my stuff. 
I don't want to lose my stuff. And so in turn, in, instead he trades in eternity for that. God's shown us one thing, and he's showing you one thing right now. He's working on that today. He's opening up your hearts. He's opening up your minds, your eyes, that you would see what he's laying out before you. There's one thing. There's something, that one thing. There's that thing that we're lacking. This young man was lacking obedience, obedience to the Lord, obedience to, um, he, he was more committed to his stuff, to what he owned, than he was to the Lord. What's that one thing? I've talked with people over and over, and it's become increasingly um, that people are like, I'm just not feeling close with the Lord. I'm just not feeling close with the Lord. It's like he's not, like he's way away from me. Well, if he's way away from you, as I've shared with you before, guess what? If he's way away from you, it's because you moved. Because God's still where he was. He never left. He never went anywhere. You're the one who moved, right? And so, so in conversation with folks, when I speak with them, and, and uh, they're saying how they just don't feel, they're not, not feeling close to the Lord. It's like he left him, he walked away from whatever. Um, but you know what I, I share with them is, okay, so how, how much time are you spending in your word? And they're not spending time in the word. They're not spending, they're, they're, it doesn't mean anything. It's like, well, that's that book, right? Well, yeah, it's important. God had it written and all that. But I know I don't crack the cover. Pastor, you tell me what you want me to hear in, su in, in service on Sunday morning. You tell me, and then I'll know what I need to know. And that's not accurate. That's not right. That's wrong, right? They're not getting in the Word. You know what else they're not doing? They're not coming to service. But it's easy to sit at home. It's easy to just watch on TV. Oh, and then it's easy to not watch on TV anymore. It's easy to watch on Facebook, and then it's easy not to watch on Facebook anymore. It's easy. Right, and they've walked away, so they're not they're not getting in the word. They're not not sharing time with brothers and sisters in the, in in the bride, right? They're 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 not praying. They're talking about how their prayer life is as they've gotten frustrated. Now they've they've stopped praying. They've stopped talking with God. They stopped walking with God. They stopped doing anything He's asking them to do, and they can't figure it out. But He's so far away from me. He's left me alone. He's abandoned me. He didn't abandon you. You abandoned Him. What's that one thing, right? When, when, when we're not close to God, that one thing might not have anything to do with him. Well, I know it didn't have anything to do with him leaving you. It had to for you leaving him. How about a life group? I, you know, I talk with people, oh, I, I really would like to be in a life group, but, you know, there's just not one in my time frame. I just it don't work my schedule. Then start one. We got resources. We'll buy more. We just bought another uh, another series and or a study, and and we'll buy, continue to buy them. We're continuing to build our library. We're continuing. If you don't know for sure, ask me. We'll talk about it. Right? Let's, let's figure it out. You know what? The scripture says something. It says, "Where two or more are gathered in my name, I'll be there." Jesus said. Right? How many does it take to have a life group? Right, you and one other person, you got you and your best bud, whatever. Don't make it a buddy time, just me and my bud getting together, drinking wine or having coffee, right? But getting together and actually studying, actually growing, right? It, it takes two people. Maybe you just have a coworker and it's just you and them. That's it. That still starts a life group because where 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 we come together that way, then Jesus is there in Matthew eighteen verse twenty, where two or more are gathered together in my name, I will be there also. Maybe it's tithing. We got some people who really struggle with the whole tithing thing. Not going to tithe. Why are you not going to tithe? Well, because it's my money. I'll do with it what I want. I can't afford to tithe. Really? You can't afford to not tithe. God tells us that. That's the only place he tells us to test him. The only place in Scripture he tells us to test him. Test me and see if I don't open the storehouses of heaven. Right? And we're like, oh, just, there's no way. Why? Because we don't trust God. That's the thing. We don't trust God. When we won't get into a life group, it's because we don't trust God. We don't trust him to bring us together with other Christians, other brothers and sisters. We don't trust him to bring us together with them that we could grow together. We don't trust him with our emotions. We don't trust him with ourselves. We don't trust him. He has never left you. 
He's in the same exact place he was all along. We've walked away. That's what's happened. When you're in that place, you've walked away. What's the one thing? What's the one thing you lack? This young rich man lacked generosity. He lacked a compassionate heart. He lacked the ability to give up his worldly possessions that he might have eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. What's the one thing you lack? Number three, what one thing do you need to let go? What one thing do you need to let go? What's that thing that we've got a grip on and we're not willing to release? What's that one thing? It's, it, this is my, but this is mine. This is mine. And it could fit right in with the whole tithing thing, right? Just got a hold of my wallet. Got a hold of it. Right? I'm not going to let it go. Maybe it's a grudge. Maybe we got a grudge against someone. We, we, we despise someone. Someone hurt our feelings. Someone betrayed us. Someone treated us poorly, at least as far as we're concerned. And we're holding on to that. We're holding on to that bitterness, that anger, that, fr- that, that, that animosity towards them. We're holding on to that grudge. Maybe we need to let go of that. Paul um, really wanted to know Jesus. He wanted to know him in the deepest of ways, right? And Paul, Paul didn't get to re- meet him until as Saul, he meets him on the road to Damascus, right? He, he, but he was trying to destroy everything Jesus had come to create, right? And, and, and Paul, but Paul talks about, he shares that, you know, man, I want to not just know of this Jesus, but I want to know Jesus, really, really know Jesus, and each of, each of us, we know of Jesus, but do we really, really know Jesus? Do we really know him? Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14, Paul said, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's One thing he's doing is he's going to leave it behind. He's going to let go. He's putting the stuff behind him. Now, he doesn't say what it is he's letting go, does he? He doesn't tell us what it is he's letting go of. But you know what? He was the cloak bearer when they stoned uh, Stephen, the first martyr for Christ. He was the cloak bearer for that, which means he gave permission. He protected their cloaks and gave permission to them as a Pharisee to go ahead and kill him. Maybe that's what he was trying to let go of. I don't know. He suffered for Jesus a lot. I mean, he's the only one in in our scriptures that that was sentenced to, to 40 lashes minus one, which means a death sentence minus one lash. He got 39 lashings five times. Five times they were one stroke away from killing him. Five times. Three times he was shipwrecked, right? Remember that? Lost at sea, trash, uh, wrecked at sea. Three times that, so five, five 39 stripes, three shipwrecks. Then he was rotted. He was beaten with rods three other times, beaten with rods. When they rotted you, that was another thing. It, they could just as well have been lashing you. All they were trying to do was bust you up. And he was rotted three times. He was stoned. Not, not recreationally, okay, with the rocks, okay. He was stoned with rocks, all right. Uh, it was not in South Dakota, right. So, um, but but uh, he was literally, he was stoned. And I find this very ironic because who did he cloak bear for? Someone who was being stoned. He was a cloak bearer for Stephen. And then, then Paul himself is stoned and left for dead. And I really like what he did because when he gets after they stone him, right? They drag him out of the city, they leave him for dead. The disciples come around him. Paul gets up and goes, "Hey, guess what? That all you got? I'm going back in." And he walks right back into Lystra. He goes right back in. He said, "Check it out, boys. I'm still here." They tried to kill him over and over and over and over again. I mean, like, literally tried to kill him. Not like, well, they said naughty words to me. They were mean. I got fired because I'm a Christian. Well, for one, you probably didn't get fired because you were a Christian. But if you did get fired because you were a Christian, well, count it as a blessing. Paul did over and over again. 
11 times right there. 12 times right there. I take that back. I almost forgot the stoning. 12 times right there. And Paul was grateful for it. Maybe that's what he was trying to let go. Maybe that's what he was trying to let go. I don't know. But there's something. Maybe there's some hurts in your past. Maybe there's some, some hurt feelings. Maybe there's some physical hurt. Maybe there's something going, I don't know what it is in your past, what it is that you've got, you're holding on to that you need to let go. But God's telling you to let go, and he's telling you right now to let it go. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt there's someone in here, at least someone in here right now that God is saying, let it go. And I'm telling you right now, let it go. You know who you are. Let it go. Release it. Let it go, that one thing that he's asking you to let go and you're refusing, you're holding on tight. You're embracing it harder than you're embracing him. Let it go. He wants you to let it go. And the only one who can let it go is you, so let it go. Let it go. In South Africa, or in Africa, I mean in South America and in, in Asia, they, have, they, try to, they catch monkeys. And if you know much about some of those countries, then you understand why they catch the monkeys, and you might not like that, but, but the reality is they catch them, and they are very good food, apparently. And so what they do, they, they've come up with a, uh, a concept to catch them. What they do is they'll take gourds, and they'll cut a hole in that gourd, and they'll cut that hole so that it's big enough that the monkey can squeeze its hand through this way. It can squeeze its hand in there, right? They'll, they'll cut that hole in that gourd. Then they'll fill the bottom of that gourd with rock, sand, whatever, um, so it's heavy so that it can't just be picked up and carried away. And then they'll drop a nut or a piece of fruit in there that the monkeys like, depending on which region they're from as to what it is as their favorite treat, right? Um, and they'll drop that in there. And what the monkey does is the monkey reaches in, they get in there, they get a hold of that fruit, and then they're trapped, and because they put weight in there, they can't just pick the gourd up and walk away with it. And now they're trapped. And now the only way they can be released is if they'll release the food that they have in their hand. If they'll release that treat they got, that little prize they just won. If they'll release it, they can be released. The problem is they hold on because it's their thing and they don't want to let go. And because they won't let go of that one little prize, that one little piece of food, that one little nugget that they could go anywhere in the forest and find... But they don't want to let go of that one little piece. Now they're trapped and they've given up all their freedom for that one little thing. What is it that you're holding on to that you won't let go of so you can release yourself from the gourd and live the free life that God desires for you to live? What's that one thing you need to let go of? We've got to let go. Our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ, not on that thing. And that thing, again, it could be a hurt feeling. It could be, and I, I know I, 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 I probably shouldn't be so snide about that. But the reality is I know I've held on to that hurt feeling. I've been so pleased when, I left go, when I've let go. So thankful, so grateful that, some, that God opened my eyes to know that I need to let go of that and be freed from it. Maybe it's a betrayal. Maybe it's a hurt feeling. Maybe it's an actual pain. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, I don't know what's going on in everybody's life. But whatever it is you got going on, whatever it is you need to let go, let go. Become free in Jesus instead of trapped by your prize, by your possession. Well, it's my pain isn't a prize. It isn't a possession. I don't want it. It's just there. No, you want it if you're not willing to let go. You want it more than you want your freedom in Christ if you're not willing to let go of that one thing, whatever that thing is. It's a choice you're making. You're the one with your fist clenched around that nut, that piece of fruit, that pain, that hurt, that anger, that hatred. You're the one who's gripping it. All you got to do is let go. Let's let go. Number four, what one promise do you need to claim? What one promise do you need to claim? Maybe you're feeling alone, insecure. Maybe you're feeling unsure about things, right? Just don't know. Well, maybe there's, there's a promise. God makes all kinds of promises. The beauty about the promises God makes, he never goes back on them. He always fulfills every promise he's ever made. He's fulfilled or it's still on its way. 
God never goes back on his promises. He doesn't promise us something and go, well, I was just kidding. God, you can count on his promises. What promise is it that maybe you need to claim? This book, this, the scriptures, it's full of promises. If you don't believe me, go in and get in it and read it. If you don't believe it's full of promises, that means you haven't been in it. I'm just being honest with you. You can lie to me all you want. You're not lying to God, okay? I'm just being honest. It's full of all kinds of promises. Let's get in it and find out. What promise is it that maybe you need to claim? David kind of knew a thing or two about promises. And he might, he might, might have had some concerns about, well, you know. Um, because remember, what happened is Samuel uh, goes and, and, and he, he anoints David when David's a, a, just a kid, right? And King Saul's still king, but he anoints David as the next king of Israel, right? And then David, from that point on, all David gets is like a step forward, two steps back, foot step forward, two steps back. It's just not because Saul was so so insecure, so so uh, filled with anger and hatred, and he he got to uh, for a period he he enjoyed David, but then there's a period when all he wants to do is kill David, right? I mean, he gets to that point because he becomes so insecure of himself, and and David's getting some glory here and there, and Saul doesn't like it because Saul wants all the glory to him because somehow he thought he was God, apparently, at that point. He he decided that he must be the only one, right? And so um, through his insecurities, he's trying to kill David, so over and over again, uh, David is, is running for his life, right? He, he's, he's, been tor- he's being tormented between Saul and between his kids and everything. I mean, his own kids were trying to kill him. He's, there's points there where, where throughout David's life, all throughout our scripture, where we, we're looking, and David's got to be going, dude, thought I was your man. You know, this is really, really, I don't get this. Well, you know what? He didn't hold on to it. All right, there's time, I mean, man, the living, it, David had some stuff thrown at him. You and I ain't had anything thrown at us. David had some stuff, and he's supposed to, wait, I'm the, I thought I was the anointed one, right? When we read our Psalms, I mean, David cries out in anguish, but he always comes back to what? He comes back to God, and he knows God's the one. He always comes back, he knows God's the one. He never, ever, ever wavers from knowing that God is his God, and God's the only one that he cares about. God's the only one he wants to please. God's the only one he wants to serve. He never, ever wavers on that. He never wavers, even though he's going through all the garbage. He's got to swim the swamp with the gators. He's got to put up with Saul trying to kill him. He's got to put up with his kids trying to kill him. He's got to put up with all the garbage. He never wavers in that. I thought I was your guy. Might have went through his head, right? It might have went through his head. But the reality was this. David tells us in Psalm 56, verse 9, he says, This one thing I know, God is for me. This one thing I know, God is for me. And actually, he says it, you can see through the exclamation, through the inference there, this one thing I know, God is for me. That's, that's where he's at. It's not, well, you know, God's kind of for me, you know. It was, he, he was a very empathetic, emphatic about it. God is for me. That's the thing I know. All I have to focus on, all I have to remember is God is for me. God, Jesus died on that cross for us. We have that. He didn't even have that. But he still knew God is for me. The God of Israel was his God, the one and only God. He knew that, and that's what he stuck to. And he knew that no matter what he was doing, no matter what he was going through, no matter the torture, the torment, no matter what Satan threw at him, no matter what his kids threw at him, no matter what Saul threw at him, he knew God is for me. And on that one thing I will focus, the one thing, is that God is for me. Paul says in Romans 8, 31, he says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God's for us, who could be against us? Could Satan defeat God? Oh, come on. I know we got some answers out there. Can Satan defeat God? Some of you are on the fence, it seems. Satan can't defeat God. He never will, never can. Satan has already been kicked out of heaven. Right? Satan's, he's just, he, Satan's clawing his way just because he's trying to take each and every one of us down because he knows his time is limited. 
He knows he's going to pay the price. The price he's already paid ain't anything compared to what he's going to pay. As long as God is for us, nobody, nothing can defeat us. If God is for us and we trust that, we believe that, we live in that, we love that, we embrace that. If we embrace the fact God is for us, that's the one thing we have to know. God is for me. And that is the promise that we need to grasp. That's the promise we need to take a hold of. God is for me. God is for me. Say that with me. God is for me. Now let's say it like we mean it. God is for me. Let's say it like we're embracing it. God is for me. Can you convince me? Is God for you? Amen. Amen. God's for us. There's one thing. He's been sharing one thing with you this morning. He's been telling you one thing. There's something. Something you need to let go of. There's something you need to embrace. There's something you need to forgive, forget. Something you need more of, something you need less of. Something you, there's that one thing he's asking you. He's pointing, he, he's not asking, he's flat out putting it on your heart this morning. There's that one thing. You need to write it down, you need to own it. You need to live it. You need to embrace it because God is for us. And as long as he's for us, nobody can take us down. As long as we're doing, here's the key. God's for me, then no one can hurt me, right? Oh, except for when I say, well, but I don't need to read this. Except for when I say, oh, th oh never mind, I don't need to do that. Except for when I say, well, we, we don't really need to gather. Except for when we say, well, why would I need to be in a Bible study? Why would I do a life group thing? Why would I do any of that? That's not important. Why would, why would I be in a prayer group? Why would I do, why would I? God's still for you. But if you're continuing to walk away from him, it's your choice. But if we will embrace and we'll hold on tightly and we'll lay our head against his chest, the fact that God is for me, God is for me, nobody can defeat me if I stay in God. And that's where the problem comes. But, but I love God. I don't do anything he asks me to do, but I love God. I won't spend any time with him, but I love God. Why is he allowing me to go through this? Because you've turned away from him, you walked away from him. Not every time. I mean, let's look at it. Job never turned away from God. You never walked away from God. He remained devout to God, right? So there's those times. Jesus never turned from him, and Satan tried to tempt him too, right? But here's the thing. We have to stay devoted to, Lord, to God. If, we're, if we think that God's going to just pour glory, glory and blessings and, and uh, all the good things all over us all the time, and we're going to go, well, you know, well, maybe later. Guess what? You're not Job. Because Job never did that. So when Satan was attacking Job, Job still had God to be centered on he still had God. He still knew God is for me. When David, when David uh, was being pursued, when they were trying to kill David all the time, David was not doing this to God. He didn't do that to God. No, God is for me. God's the one thing. David said that. Don't blame God if you've walked away. But there's that one thing, and today, today's the day. Today's that New Year's resolution. Today's that day we resolve Whatever that one thing is God's putting on you, whatever he's opening your heart up to, whatever he's putting before your eyes right now, and there's no way you're going to avoid it, whatever it is, if we'll embrace that one thing and we'll trust that God is for me and he will never leave me, he will never forsake me, if we'll trust in that and we don't leave him, that one thing is the thing he's asking you to do. Your life will change and never be the same. Your life will change and never be the same. It'll be, it, it'll be a life walked in Christ, right? If, 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 if we'll listen to the one thing he's asking us to do today and we'll stop the stiff arm and instead we'll link arms with God and with each other. If that one thing, God said, 
in Habakkuk 1.5, he says, Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm going to do something in your days that you wouldn't believe even if you're told. Look, folks, he's telling you right now what he wants you to change. Guess what? This coming year, this coming day, this coming week, this coming month, whatever it is that's coming before us, this coming afternoon, this, the remainder of this morning, right? Whatever it is, God's got something very glorious in it, and we will never see it if we do not follow his, in the steps that he leads us on. If we do not focus, if we do not grasp that one thing. But he's saying right here, he's saying, look, I got some things for you. I can, I can write it out right there on the floor for you. I can have my son lay, kneel down as you're accusing the woman caught in adultery, and I can have him write it out what it is that's the rest of your life. I can write the whole thing out. I can write out just the blessings I have for you just for today even. I can have him write it out for you, and you won't even know it. You won't understand it. You won't understand it because why? Because it's so amazing what he has for us, what he plans for us, what he desires for us is so amazing. For one, we think we're not, we're not, well, I don't deserve it. For two, well, I just don't have time for that God thing. And three, even if, even if we're walking, even if we're Job, right? Even if we're Job. Job, Job never turned from God. He still didn't understand it. Even he argued with God at the end, right? He's like, come on, man, right? And God's okay with that. When he's walking us through some stuff, he's okay if we go, come on, man. I, I don't get it. I don't understand. I don't see it. God's telling us, though, it's going to be amazing. He will do things that are amazing that we won't even understand. We won't even grasp. Even if it's right before us, we won't believe it. It's like, how could this possibly be? Let's grasp that one thing. Let's just grasp that one thing. Let's look forward to the amazing adventure he's got in front of us, the amazing journey that he has before us. Let's take that one thing. Let's take that one thing and let's run with that one thing. Let's embrace that one thing. And then let's embrace our God with that one thing. Let's let go of the world's stuff. And let's gain our freedom in Jesus Christ. Please join me. Dear Lord, thank you so very much. Thank you so, so very much, dear Lord. We don't, we don't get it. Man, a living, we don't get it. There's, oh man, so many things that, that man, we just don't understand. And, and why would God do this for me? Or why would God do that? And, and why did he? And whatever. And, and Lord, we don't get it. And Lord, you know that and you, you still you still continue to bless us you still continue to lead us you could still continue to guide us you can still continue to call us dear lord to continue to take the steps that you have for us so today today you've revealed something to each and every one of us at least one thing to each and every one of us dear lord there's something that you've opened us up to today dear lord and i ask that you would help each and every one of us to step into that one thing that one thing lord and for some of us, that one thing is just a matter of we're going to commit our lives to living for you, dear Lord, that, that Jesus is going to be our Lord that, so that he can be our Savior. Some, some of us, that's what it is today, Lord. Some of us today, it's, it's going to be a recommitment to our marriage or maybe a first-time commitment to our marriage. Maybe we weren't even committed to it. Lord, may, whatever that is, maybe it's, it's, maybe it's joining a a life group maybe it's it's tithing maybe it's it's just flat out loving people maybe it's going out and actually doing things for those in our community and not needing to brag to everyone about what we did because we did it for them we didn't do it for ourselves father i don't know what it is i don't know what it is for each and every person here but lord i know there's that thing that one thing that you're you're telling them. You've put it on their hearts. You've put it before their minds. You've put it before their eyes, Lord. There's that one thing, and I ask you to give each and every one of us the courage, the courage to step forward into that one thing, the courage, the desire, dear Lord, to crawl up into your lap, lay our head upon your chest, that we might hear your heartbeat, that we would receive from your hand that one thing, that thing we need to let go of, 
that thing we need to embrace, the thing we need more of or less of, that one thing, Lord. I ask that we not lose that one thing. I ask that we don't take that one thing lightly, that instead we take it wholeheartedly, completely devoted, dear Lord, take it completely devoted from your hand to ours, that we go forward and do with it what it is you ask of us to do. Father, I just pray all these things in your loving Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. for coming and worshiping with us and remember that uh, Christmas Eve again is on at five o'clock hope to see all of you there and have a great week